Hello, change makers. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we appreciate you carving time out of your busy schedule to be with us for the next hour and a half. We have a very large agenda. We're packed. And so, but before I introduce our moderators, I want to invite you for a moment of reflection for the 111, 119,000 lives that we lost in the US due to COVID-19. We also want to reflect and recognize the selfless act of service by our healthcare professionals, essential workers, many of whom are women and people of color. And especially we want to reflect on the memories of the many lives we lost due to racial violence. Please mute yourself for a minute or a second. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, again, welcome, change makers. I am Sega Medhin, a mother and the president of the UN Women USA North Carolina chapter. And on behalf of our board and the members at large, I welcome you again to this table of healing of women as bridge builders. I hope this mother to mother experience and storytelling will leave us inspired to act with our heart, our head, and our hands. Our intent is to create an intentional space to humanize the pain and its impact on the basic human rights, living with dignity. The UN Women USA North Carolina chapter is a 501c3 in good standing. And for the past 10 years, our mission has been to contribute as an education entity advocacy and to raise funds for all the UN women empowerment across the globe. Make sure you visit our Q&A box on the side of the screen and on this call. And if you want to uh, share your experience tonight, our hashtag is mother to mother NC and our handle is also UN, at UN women NC. Um, I wanna also say that this event is a brainchild of an amazing lady, uh, Sandra Rivers, uh, one of our board members. And I especially want to thank her for leading this vision. Our board and supporters have also been hard at work to make this happen in less than three weeks. So I want to thank Diane Jordan, CJ Scarlett, Michelle Mitchell, Ray Boone, Ginger Garner. I'm so lucky to work with all of you. So yes. blessed. Thank you. And then for me, this is a journey. We've been on a long journey and it has taken us into the belly of the beast heightened racism and the power of economic inequities. So the mental stain of racism on humanity is definitely an opportunity gap that needs our collective consciousness so we can leave a legacy of raised floor for all of us. And this to struggle through peaceful protesting has not been easy. We cried, we are conflicted, we're also traumatized. And in the words of Oprah, call a thing a thing, we surely have to address not only the violence that's out there, but we have to name the violence that's inside our hearts, our structures, our institutions. And I, like many of you, admire our protesters' courage. As a mother, I see our children that are risking their lives as they practice the activism of the heart. And also because they know that black lives matter is the oxygen of our democracy. So they're breathing. So then it is time to call up, not to call out, but we're calling up our institutional courage. We've got the streets that are filled with courage, but institutions need to have some courage and also a cross-sectoral partnership for a better world that celebrates diversity while it's addressing disparity. And in this age of change, we are called to midwifery. As women, we know what that means, or give birth to a lasting transformation of self and institutions. And tonight, as we listen to these mother-to-mother -mother dialogues, I invite us to stand in inquiry, commit to activism of our hearts for an equal and just society, and to learn how to raise our children. I want to acknowledge all the change makers on tonight's mother-to-mother -mother panel, 
for their intentional leadership and for accepting our invitation in such a short period of time. Raleigh Police Chief Cassandra Dick Brown, Durham Chief Police Sherilyn Davis, Dr. Vanessa Abernathy, Tomiko Jenkins, Larry Peppers, Suzanne Grimes, Reverend Crystal Devin, Senator Terry Van Dyne, Lorraine Shumate, Lauren Shumate, Chantel Thomas. I will definitely leave the introduction, the, the full introduction in the capable hands of our moderators, two amazing journalists that I will have the privilege of introducing them to you now, Amanda Lamb and Tamra Gibbs. I know they don't need an introduction from me, but I do believe that if I say that Amanda is a television reporter covering the crime beat for WRAL for over 30 years, she has a lot of experience in front of the camera. She has also published 10 books since 2007, including three memoirs about parenting and two children's books. She writes a blog every Monday for WRAL, which is called Go Ask Mom. She graduated from Northwestern and Duke University and makes her home outside Raleigh with her husband and her two precious daughters. Thank you, Amanda, for joining us. Tamara? Tamara Gibbs, uh, what I could say about her, believer, writer, speaker, and teacher. The former broadcast journalist honed her skills as a storyteller for 22 years in a competitive newsroom in Illinois and North Carolina, including ABC 11 Eyewitness News. Tamara right now has transitioned, transitioned to the public sector as a public information officer for the Durham County Sheriff's Office and currently serves as the marketing communications manager, manager at an e-commerce solution corporation based in Research Triangle Park. The floor is yours, ladies, and thank you very much this evening for being with us. Well, thank you for those, that great introduction. Um, I'd just like to say that I'm humbled and honored to be here and be part of this conversation. I have two daughters who are 17 and 20 years old, and I can say that I've learned a lot uh, over my 30 years as a journalist and also covering the protests in the past couple of weeks. But I've probably learned more from my daughters than just about anyone else because they are um, the leaders in this, this time in history and, and they're engaged. And if you just look at social media, you can see that young people are really leading this discussion and hopefully leading um, their mothers and their fathers and others of us that um, are, you know, hopefully moving towards change in the right direction. So mm -hmm. I'll let you know, throw it over to Tamara. Oh, Amanda, it's good to share some screen space with you after years of being in the field uh, together for opposing teams, but nonetheless uh, committed to being truth tellers uh, and sharing uh, great stories. Uh, and, and thanks, Sega, for the uh, introduction. Uh, and it's Tamara, but, you know, tomato, tomato, no problem. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I just want to thank everyone who took the time this evening to Everybody join this, this uh, roundtable discussion, this opportunity to listen, this opportunity to learn, and this opportunity to share. Uh, and also, we welcome, you know, mothers in general, all of those aunts out there, honorary aunts and, and uh, grandmothers and all those women in the community that feel, fulfill a maternal role, uh, whether they have children or not. So uh, I'm excited. I don't know about you guys, but I'm excited to just kind of dive right in and, and get this uh, conversation started. Right. So what we're going to do is we're going to introduce all of our panelists, and then we're going to go through each section. So we're going to start with law enforcement, then we're going to do the mental health care providers, and then we're going to talk to the moms in about 20 minutes for each segment. So I have the privilege of introducing the first person on our law enforcement panel, and that is Chief Cassandra Deck Brown. Uh, you know her as the Raleigh Police Chief. She started to lead that department in 2013, and she got into law enforcement right after graduating from East Carolina U University in 1987. She has a master's degree in public administration from NC State. Um, she has a deep belief in power, the power of community engagement and collaboration, and you've seen that evidenced, uh, obviously, in what she's been dealing with, her department's been dealing with in the past few weeks. Um, she has consistently displayed professionalism, good judgment, and integrity. They are her hallmarks as a leader. She believes her primary responsibilities as chief of police 
are summarized in two words found on the badge and of course on the badge of every police officer, serve and protect. So welcome. Welcome Chief uh, Deck Brown. We also wanna make a quick footnote before we uh, introduce the rest of our expert panelists here today. The Q&A function is going to be used for questions during this uh, live webinar event. Uh, and you can use the thumbs up to vote up a question if you like the question or if you have a similar question. Uh, and then we'll also uh, try to get to all the questions. We may not be able to because time is limited, uh, but we'll certainly do our best to try to get to as many questions as possible. And again, a quick reminder, if you want to share any of this content, any of the things that you're hearing today, please be sure to use hashtag mother to mother on social media. So uh, joining us also this evening is Police Chief Sarah C.J. Davis. She is the first African-American woman to lead the Durham Police Department. Chief Davis has more than 32 years of dedicated service in law enforcement. Prior to her arrival at the Bull City, Davis spent 30 years in the Atlanta Police Department. And last summer, Chief Davis was sworn in as the 42nd president of the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives. She's also a mother of an adult daughter as well as a grandmother. So welcome, Chief Davis. Um, we also have several healthcare providers on our panel tonight because obviously, this has been a difficult time for a lot of people. Um, not only are we dealing with this um, intense time over equality and racial equality or inequality in our country, but we are also dealing with COVID. So this, these are folks that can help answer some of those questions. Uh, I am introducing Dr. Vanessa Abernathy. She is a clinical psychologist with mindset consultant and liberation, a mindset consultant and liberation theologian whose aim is to transform professions and systems that oppress people. She offers psychotherapy services to people in Greensboro, North Carolina through Phoenix Rising Psychological Services and her online mindset consulting services are for female entrepreneurs and for life coaches who support abuse survivors. Welcome. Welcome indeed. Also joining us this evening is Tamiko Jenkins, who is a licensed therapist with over 15 years of experience as a mental health clinician. Uh, Tamiko received her BA from the University of North Carolina at Charlotte mm -hmm. and a master's of social work from the University of, of Georgia. The mom of five, uh, her kids range in age from one to 17 years old. I felt like I needed to mention that. <laughs> and she currently serves as the Senior Associate Dean of Students at Agnes Scott College. Welcome. And of course, we have a panel of mothers tonight because this conversation is about how we as mothers can um, help with this, this changing world and, and lead our children as they lead us. So I wanna introduce Lottie Peppers. She is the mother of two boys, ages 16 and 13 years old. She worked as a research scientist before coming, becoming a science educator. She has worked with first generation and high need students in several states, including Texas, New Jersey, and North Carolina. And she earned her bachelor and master's of science degrees from Texas Tech University. Welcome Lottie. Welcome. And also joining us is Susan Grimes. She is the proud mother of two sons, ages eight and 16. She is a corporate attorney and Grimes earned her JD from Syracuse University College of Law, as well as her bachelor's in English from the world-renowned HBCU Spelman College. Welcome, Susan Grimes. And we also welcome to our mom panel, Reverend Crystal Devine. She is with the City Well UMC in Durham since July of 2018. She was also the pastor of discipleship at Swansboro UMC. She has a master of divinity from Duke. She is passionate about the intersections of race, gender, sexual orientation, and class as it pertains to Christian faith. She's committed to fostering healthy practices of communal care, womanist theology, racial reconciliation and ethics, and Wesleyan discipleship. She has a nine-year-old son named Mark, and her favorite quote is, in all matters that love must be the ethic by which we conduct ourselves because God is love. Welcome, Reverend. 
Welcome. Uh, also, a warm welcome for Senator Terry Van Dyne. She is the Democratic member of the North Carolina Senate, representing District 49, which encompasses most of Asheville and Buncombe County. She grew up in the Chicago area and attended the University of Illinois. Boop, boop. Uh, that I'm an alum of U of I, so she gets a shout out there. And where she earned her bachelor's degree in economics. Senator Van Dyne was appointed to the state Senate in 2014. And in 2015, she was elected as the minority whip. Prior to her career in the state legislature, Senator Van Dyne had a successful career in the technology sector until she retired in 1992. So welcome, Senator Van Dyne. And the, uh, the final person I'm going to introduce tonight on the panel, the, the mother's panel, is Lauren Shumate. She is a VP of marketing for a technology services company called One Source. She has three children, uh, ages 11 to 21. Um, she's a BA in marketing from the University of Wisconsin Madison. She's from a family that is Hispanic and Jewish, so she has dealt with anti Semitism and racism as well. She says all lives don't matter until Black lives matter. And she said she wants to use her voice as an ally to create permanent change, and she demands a different future for her children. Welcome. Welcome. And last but certainly not least, Chantel Thomas is driving marketing strategy for companies in the Lenovo partner ecosystem. She is a proud graduate of St. Augustine's University, a local HBCU in Raleigh. She is the proud mother of three, including two sons who are in college and a 12 year old. Welcome to all of our mothers, our expert panelists. And Amanda, I think it's time to just kind of dive in. Why don't you kick us off? Okay, great. So we're going to start with the law enforcement. So we have two chiefs, very lucky to have two chiefs and two female chiefs joining us uh, for this mother to mother conversation. Um, and you guys can just jump in chiefs when you, when you, when you, want to, you want to answer these questions. And I think that the, the first question that we want to ask is, um, you know, what are your values for your officers in your organization? And as you lead these very large law enforcement organizations, how do you help instill those values in those officers? Well, I guess I'll start off. Um, you know, our values are many, but when uh, people talk about what's important to me um, in my department, the first is always community engagement, and the second one is crime prevention. And if I can just ensure that my officers keep those principles, at least as a starting point, that community engagement is critical for us in crime prevention to make our community safe. But, you know, we have a mission statement. Uh, you know, we have value statements. Our officers have to take an oath of office. You know, when they first come, there are so many uh, layers of reiterating what's important and critical in our work. And part of our officer's oath of office is that, you know, I will honestly and impartially execute my, my duties as a law enforcement person. I mean, these themes are over and over again. Our vision statement about being committed to the Constitution of the United States and the rights of all people to ensure the administration of justice and that's equitable to all people. And now, more than ever, we're having to make sure that we reiterate these things you know, to our officers and that they understand what my philosophy is as a chief. You know, that's what's most important to me, that they understand where I stand and what my philosophy is and what I will uh, tolerate and what I won't tolerate. And over the last four years being in the city of Durham, my officers absolutely know what I will tolerate and what I won't tolerate and uh, what is representative of us as an organization. Thank you. Chief Deck Brown, would you weigh in on that? I'm not sure. I'm not sure you can hear me. We can. We can hear you. Great. But I can't hear you all at all. I'm actually listening to you through Sega's phone. All of a sudden, I'm having major technical difficulty. So can you please ask the question again? 
Absolutely. So we were talking about, you know, you're leading a very large organization with a lot of officers, many different ages, uh, many different backgrounds. What are the core values that you want to instill in your officers and how do you, how do you make sure that um, they are abiding by those core values? Well, the core values of the Raleigh Police Department, and I apologize because I'm getting a lot of feedback of my own voice, um, really start with understanding its service, its courage, its fairness, its integrity, and its compassion. But we know that that's not enough. So those core values start at the time an officer is uh, or an applicant begins the process to seek employment with the police department. Uh, their core value, our core values have to be congruent with the values that those individuals bring to the workplace. And I can assure you, there are many people who don't get hired because of what we find in the background investigation. Uh, those aspects are character traits that are not congruent with what we expect. And then once they're hired, and there's a whole process, background investigation, uh, psychologicals, um, polygraph, there's, there's a whole list of things that are required by the state. But then that academy is that integration process. And it's a socialization process as well, because that individual has to come with an understanding of what our expectations are, what is laid out by the state of North Carolina to be a criminal justice officer, but what is also embodied within uh, the policies, the procedures, and the laws within the state of North Carolina. And that socialization process begins in that academy by that individual who comes from wherever they come from, um, taking on this career and understanding the expectations that come with it. And it doesn't stop there, it continues throughout the course of the career. Training is paramount and it is reiterated on so many levels. Uh, there is an ethics block uh, in that academy, but then there's another ethics block that's taught every year uh, to in-service training uh, through, to our officers. And, and not only that, but they learn about the law enforcement code of ethics, the canons of police ethics. They learn the importance of taking that oath. And, and that oath, when you look at how it's, it's, it's written, um, it is a promise before those who hear it, and it's a promise to God uh, that they will uphold the, the duties and responsibilities expected of a law enforcement officer. Uh, and uphold the, the laws of the land as well. And with that ethics, uh, training and expectation is an understanding that there are consequences for actions that are not congruent with those very core values that, that I mentioned in the beginning. I hope I've helped to answer some of that question, but I hear very little of what you're saying. You did, you did, thank you. Uh, Tamara, I'll let you go next. Yeah, from uh, the training to the socialization in the academy, uh, and for either chiefs, uh, whomever wants to answer this, um, just generally speaking, is it your opinion that law enforcement is evolving? Um, if so, what role will your organizations play uh, in the profession's uh, transformation? Well, I believe law enforcement is absolutely evolving. and. It's unfortunate that law enforcement has been forced to evolve. Um, you know, with these uh, various, you know, uh, tragic incidents that have occurred around the country over the years, um, law enforcement professionals and leaders, some of us already knew that change need to needed to happen. I knew change needed to happen when I first became a police officer 30 something years ago. This was a traditionally uh, male run dominated, you know, um, environment. And most of the leaders at that time were Caucasian leaders. And we've evolved over the years, but we haven't evolved in a sense as an industry that we recognize the historical injustices that have been um, committed in minority communities um, historically. And, 
to acknowledge that and to understand why um, some communities are very uncomfortable and even afraid of law enforcement. And officers struggle with this whole evolution of, well, why are they angry at us? Because we do great things every day. And that wasn't us in Minneapolis, that was some other guy. And I have to explain to them that the uniform is the uniform. It doesn't matter who's wearing the uniform. When an injustice occurs in a community by someone who is supposed to protect and serve, it is a negative reflection on everyone. So my colleagues were the black, white, um, you know, Hispanic, it doesn't matter. They are coming to grips with the fact that this is an industry that has to first acknowledge um, where we need to change and meet our community members where they are and have them involved in that change as well. All right, well, thank you. Uh, Chief Doug Brown, are you able to hear us? Would you like to weigh in? I, I picked up pieces of, of the, the comments. Yes, evolution has to happen in policing. And, uh, and I think we're at a pivotal crossroad now um, and, and we are at a place that we haven't been before. We have experienced a lot of what is surfacing, but I think that this time and now is where we have to make those changes and we have to see complete changes in law enforcement. Uh, the, the evolution or the reform, if you will, it starts within the individual organizations. There have been many of our membership organizations uh, on national platforms that have tried for a while to submit um, legislation and, and, and areas for, for reform in law enforcement. Um, and it, it just hasn't moved as fast as some of your progressive chiefs have wanted it to move. And so I think we are at that point. And, and it, it begins when we talk about reforming, um, it begins with understanding the history of policing. Uh, and, you know, I, I've shared with our officers because I'm the one who teaches the ethics a lot. And it's important to, to understand the history of, our pol of policing uh, so that we don't repeat it for one, but then you, you truly have an understanding of where you want to take uh, policing as a profession. And uh, when, you, when you're in the 21st century uh, and you are having conversations about law enforcement and the reference of slave patrol is prevalent um, in, in the conversation uh, that means that we haven't we haven't moved that needle far enough, and, and when you take that beyond that, and you look at the history of policing, and you look at America as a melting pot, and you we know that we have we have uh, Holocaust survivors that are here, but we know that the history of policing at that time uh, was the Gestapo, but then here in America in the 60s. Uh, we know how people of color, specifically Black people, were treated in the 60s. And while that timeline seems so far away from 1830 in America, we know that there are people who are continuing to fight in the struggle of equality and equity uh, in police relations, who, who walked the line in the 60s. To, to fight for those same issues and, and, and fight against those injustices. So I, we're at a point where we have to evolve uh, if this profession has an opportunity to survive and we have to be intentional about it. Thank you, Chief. Um, one more brief question for the law enforcement panel and then we'll let you guys go. We know you're busy. Uh, you have a lot of other things you, you probably need to be doing right now, but, um, you know, those of us have kids of different ages, um, there's a lot of pain, there's a lot of anger right now, um, and it's directed at law enforcement. How can we as mothers help create a positive 
um, relationship between our children and our communities and law enforcement? How can we be part of that, that positive change? Well, you know, as a mother and um, a mentor, um, an aunt, and just so involved in, you know, young people's lives, you know, I, I think it's important to be honest, to be honest about what has happened, uh, to be honest about the history of an industry, and to also be honest about the fact that there are thousands of officers that go to work every day that want to do the right thing. And that, you know, unfortunately, society cannot live without public safety. There's so, so much work that officers do every day. And I think to help with kids and our young people to understand, and I don't even like to use the one bad apple spoils the whole bunch, our industry is not an industry that can afford to have one bad apple. The consequences are too grave for that. So I say that one day young people may need an officer and we can't build a wall between, you know, uh, the, the, the other elements in the world uh, and, and, and keep um, our young people from being able to feel like they can trust so we have to heal together. We have to find opportunities to have conversations so that our young people know that officers have kids too. The officers were hurt and angry and disappointed and wore Black Lives Matter on their mask, you know, and, and understand that this is a crisis that our industry must change. And I just say, be honest with our young people so that they can help, so we can help them heal and help them have a future. Absolutely, well, thank you both uh, for your time, for your candid uh, responses, uh, and for just being here as mothers and members of the community and women leaders in our community. So uh, on behalf of uh, UN Women in the North Carolina chapter, we. We want to thank both of you for, for being here with us this evening. Uh, you're free to go should you have other uh, pressing matters. Uh, we certainly would understand. And now we want to uh, return to our mental health experts who are joining us tonight. Uh, I don't know if anyone else feels this way, but it sure feels like 2020 has been a long year. And for that reason, uh, self-care is so important, checking in with ourselves, checking in with our spouses, our children. And so we have two amazing experts here on the panel to kind of uh, chat with us a little bit of, about uh, what's going on and how it probably is impacting all of us. Um, so uh, either of you jump in with this question, uh, you know, help us understand the mental health impact on all of us, you know, regardless of your race, your age, your class, your gender, as we navigate a global pandemic, uh, we navigate the collective trauma of George Floyd's death, murder, um, help us understand how that's all sort of playing out in terms of our mental health impact as we all sort of navigate discussions about systemic racism as well. Um, I guess I'll start. I was going to um, wait for my colleagues. So um, as a psychologist and as a mother uh, and in a, as a woman of faith, I do think of things systemically. And one of the things that stands out is that we are also still in the middle of a pandemic. Um, one of the things that makes it difficult is usually the impact is because things are beyond our control. When we talk about stress, stress is any kind of demand on our system. Distress is when there's more demand than really we have the resources to uh, meet that demand. And then trauma is really something that really communicates a real or actual or even experienced threat to someone's physical or psychological integrity. Are they, and that has long lasting effects. So when you think about this, locus of control is very important and we feel out of control. And one of the things about worry and fear in this pandemic and also in the uh, racial unrest uh, which I do call uh, domestic terrorism, it is something that makes us 
they're real. It's the difference between real and imagined fear. Imagine fear when you're in therapy or with your good girlfriend, you can kind of talk it through and say, well, I mean, how likely is that? But this is the type of fear that is very realistic, that has been systemic, uh, that shows up in our schools. Um, even the pandemic displayed some of the disparity that was in our community, some of the food insecurity, uh, just with the devices that were put out into the school systems, the ability for parents to copy um, assignments and and or even have enough devices for a family of maybe say six children who might be in public school so as mothers one of the things that can be helpful is to know that there's still so much we can do to impact our children and to buffer them and to help them really um, be resilient as they are it's almost humanly impossible i tell people to ruin a child it's amazing some of the things that they have survived uh, even in their own families, and their own communities. So when we think about uh, worry, our appetite, we might lose our appetite, we might have excessive appetite, our sleep gets disturbed. With the pandemic, we didn't even know what day it was. Um, <laughs> our nights got turned into days, and that's excruciating uh, because rain, sleep is like a raincoat. Uh, if it rains right now and I put on a raincoat, I mean, the raincoat won't stop the rain but it will lessen the impact on me and so there's certain things that really get out of sync and that we can take control of with the support of support of others thank you tamika thank you i think that is so beautifully um stated dr abernathy i would add you know certainly um as we are trying to navigate the national landscape of the double pandemic, um, Black folks showed up here with some intergenerational trauma, right? Um, and folks also were already vulnerable from um, experiences that impacted their mental health and wellness, um, showing up pre-double pandemic um, with depression and anxiety and symptoms related to that. And so this national crisis has certainly exacerbated so many symptoms for so many people um, and navigating what access to care looks like um, is just very different. Um, so I'm unable to have a face-to-face -face appointment with a mental health provider or my psychiatrist to refill my psychotropic medications, um, but can I do telehealth appointments? And in order to do that, do I have the privacy in my home with children running around or a partner um, and do I have access to technology in order um, to get the, the health care that I need? And so I really try to embrace a, a mind, body, spirit um, paradigm and certainly recognizing that um, the double pandemic has negatively impacted across all those spheres and what does um, wellness planning look like in this new uh, climate. And it requires so much creativity, so much collaboration and co here um, in order to feel supported. Thank you, ladies. Um, you covered so much, but I think one of the things we wanted to talk about and you touched on it is this race related stress. And I think that there is something really valid in the stress of the mothers who have black children, but black sons, especially what's going to happen if he gets stopped by a police officer. Um, and we've talked as a group when we were preparing for this uh, with moms who said, you know, we have a talk about what you do if you get stopped by a police officer. Um, and that's a lot of stress. So my question is to both of you, how do we talk to our children about race, black children and white children? How do we talk to them about race and racism? I mean, what, what should we be doing now, whether they're you know, young children, whether they're teenagers, whether they're in college, what, what should we be doing to help them be healthy and confident and loving? I think one of the things that the chief has already mentioned is that we can be open and honest with our children. Uh, and I would just, I think, first of all, when we say should, I mean, we're not obligated to do uh, anything one way. This is something we've never done before. So, um, there's some literature out there on being a good enough mom. And so if we can just give ourselves permission to be a good enough mom, that's first and foremost. Um, but as far as speaking to them, 
it's helpful to be open and honest and also to speak in a very developmentally appropriate way. Um, research shows that children start to notice difference at around three or four years old. So we're walking around acting as if we don't think they notice difference, but they do. Uh, they notice different hair color, different hair texture. They notice different shapes in their bodies uh, and their height, especially by the time they're in uh, preschool outside the home. But when we talk about um, how to empower our children, one thing is to make sure we use emotional vocabulary, help them identify and or reclaim their emotional vocabulary. Because when it's a problem and they don't know how to communicate, sometimes you can mirror the emotion that they're experiencing. Sometimes you can name and, and give them language for the emotion they're experiencing. Even at 15, 16, I have two daughters. One of them is 14. And sometimes I have to um, say, it seems like you know, you're angry and, and one, and emotion that I think is important to validate in this time is that anger is a human alarm of a real or perceived injustice. And if we can't name that as, uh, in, especially in here in the South, in this, you know, uh, what we call the Bible Belt, the Judeo-Christian um, environment, heavily religious, anger is not sin, right? It, it really is an alarm. So if we're trying to do something in unison, and I offend you and you don't let me know, then that's going to be buried and really going to interfere with our ability to tackle whatever it is that's coming against us, the, the, either of the pandemics, and really solve it together. Um, so doing that, mirroring, naming it, uh, they're being open and honest with them, and also doing it as much as you're capable, uh, whatever your capacity is. I think checking in with your own emotional capacity is critical. Because as women, whenever we are short on any resource, time, energy, money, one of the first places we skimp is on ourselves. And when we do that, we rob the very people we love of the one thing that only we can give, which is ourselves. So the airlines had it right. You put on your mask and then you take care of that of your child. So definitely don't say anything you just see on TV if you can't communicate it in a way that lets your child know that it's okay uh, to be present with this emotion and we're going to get through this together. Great. Thank you. Tameka? I, I completely agree. And what I would also offer um, is, you know, as we work together towards um, an anti-racist um, society, one of the most important aspects of dismantling oppression in white supremacy is um, how liberating rest um, and recovery is in that process. And so um, it, it's, a, it's, very, um, it's very important that our children see us resting and modeling um, how important our wellness and our well being is. And so, whether that looks like, you know, a nap when you need a nap, um, taking a walk, connecting with your um, mental health providers through a telehealth format but really prioritizing your wellness and well-being, um, eating and water and all that as well. Um, I'll also add how important, um, particularly Black joy, um, is laughter, creating memories, um, taking the opportunity um, to resist and rebel in those ways also dismantles oppression um, when we allow ourselves to collectively um, engage in activities that bring us joy, um, that fill our spirits, experiencing laughter. Um, there are so many age appropriate, um, I think, books and videos that you can incorporate to have these conversations as well. Um, the conversation that I have with my 17 year old who's driving um, and heading to college soon looks very different than the conversation that I have with my eight year old, but I'm able to lean into um, different resources that are available um, either through, you know, media or, or books, text to help have those conversations as well. This is wonderful information, ladies. Uh, one quick question because we want to save all of our time for our moms who I know want to weigh in. Um, what are some key si signals that you should be paying attention to as an individual that lets you know, hey, I have stress, I might have anxiety, and if so, after you notice those signals, what are some resources, what are some tangible things that folks can do right now? I, 
I always, um, I'm a proponent of listening to your body. You know, a lot of times um, I work at a college and we're an integrated wellness center. So we're in the same space as um, health services and mental health services are in the same building. And a lot of times um, students will show up and they'll complain about headaches or they'll be experiencing some sort of um, gastrointestinal issue, uh, diarrhea, constipation, um, and they'll recognize that their physical body isn't well, um, but not making the connection that oftentimes um, it's connected with anxiety or you're feeling depressed. And so I think one of the first markers is to pay attention to your body, um, recognizing uh, your sleep patterns. I think oftentimes when you're stressed or you know experiencing a crisis or trauma, um, our sleep is usually one of the first indicators, either sleeping too much or not getting enough sleep. Um, any sleep disturbance around like nightmares uh, to be included. Um, I also think a lot about um, appetite, I think is also one of those check engine lights that go off in our bodies that signal um, that you're stressed and overwhelmed. And so I think paying attention to the data that our bodies offer us that signal um, that there may be some stress and fatigue and also being still and quiet enough to get in connected with what you're emotionally experiencing. I think we're often so busy, particularly now, um, working from home during a crisis while trying to homeschool children. Um, it's hard to stay in touch with like how I'm feeling in those moments. And so being cognizant of the need to pause so that you can hear um, what your thoughts are, what you're feeling and what you're experiencing. And once you recognize that something um, is not operating well in your mind or in your body, knowing what resources are available to you. Oftentimes your employer, if you're employed, um, will have an EAP program, an employee assistance program that will offer you know, sometimes five to six to eight free sessions. Um, and so you would want to tap into that resource um, to get connected with a mental health professional. Um, but there are so many other um, outlets that are available online as well, yoga or connecting with the Zumba class, but just making sure that there are outlets that are available to center your mental health and wellness and to begin to unpack um, whatever it is that you're experiencing. And I'm always an advocate of um, medication if you need that as well. And so connecting with a psychiatrist if your mood requires um, chemical uh, stabilization as well. Fantastic. Dr. Abernathy, was there anything else you wanted to add or was that pretty comprehensive? That was so comprehensive. I have nothing to say about the mother's uh, care. I would um, just encourage moms to look for some signs that uh, this may be stressful or more demanding, almost on the traumatic side for children. There's um, a three symptom cluster. One is re-experiencing the trauma. And because, um, for especially for young children, zero to five, their language is really play. So they're not going to come into my office and talk, but they may. Uh, I saw a video yesterday on Instagram of a little boy playing basketball in the driveway and he saw a police officer's car coming down the road. And so he stopped playing and hid behind the car. And so whoever captured that video creates space for him to talk about that because he looked like he was uh, of elementary age. But even for young children, they may be trying to uh, find a solution. Uh, one of the things about the pandemic, even the COVID-19, is that even when we're sleeping, our mind is trying to problem solve. So our sleep may not be as restful. Um, but if they're re-experiencing the trauma, they're acting it out in their play, they become more aggressive with their siblings, their peers, parents, uh, and even sometimes self-injury for themselves. Because I think one of the greatest traumas when it comes to racial uh, injustice is that there's a difference between guilt and shame uh, we can train our children, and, and it's not just our boys, to, you know, do this because, you know, police may see you in a very antagonistic way, or anyone in the world now. It's not just people with a badge. Um, but when it comes to shame, shame is feeling, guilt is feeling bad about what you did. Shame is feeling bad about who you are. And so you, as a mother, you have the power to help your child create a narrative that makes sense of the world that says not all police officers think this way, that humanize people who have a struggle with mental health, um, and that also they have sometimes hyper arousal 
where they uh, may not be able to sleep. They may, you may see them as regressing almost developmentally. They were fully potty trained and now they're, you know, wetting the bed or, or, or soiling themselves during the day. Or sometimes they lose speech because they can't vocalize. It almost seems unspeakable. Trauma usually does, but it's always speakable and that allows us to release what needs to happen. And the other is avoidance. They may avoid all thoughts and ideas related to, you know, we here in Greensboro have touch a truck with the uh, junior league and it's a fun event. But if you find that your child this year doesn't want to touch the police officer's truck or to have a conversation, be mindful of those types of behaviors and know that you as a mother, you whenever the, the best treatment that is out there really focuses on the child-parent relationship and looking at the trauma lens, but mainly that attachment lens, and how can you reaffirm for them that they are valuable, that they are safe, and that you're going to take action to protect them, and you're going to be very clear in your communication to, to let them know that. Thank you. Thank you so much for both of your responses. And I'm sure everyone online um, can benefit from um, such a sage wisdom, but also loving and compassionate advice. So thank you both for uh, your commitment to the community and helping those that you, you serve. Uh, Amanda, I think we're at that point where uh, moms get to weigh in. <laughs> I mean, that was some great information and some great advice. And I think you know, what's really interesting is we have kids of all different ages and it's important to talk to them differently. And I think that's that's a very key point that you ladies both made. Um, so now we have this great panel of mothers. We have six mothers with very different backgrounds and different life experiences and different age children, and they're gonna weigh in. And, you know, I think I just wanna kick it off and you guys can jump in, unmute when you wanna answer um, your uh, one of these questions. But I think, you know, we've all been going through a really difficult time. Uh, we've all been watching these events unfold. Uh, there's a lot of pain. Um, there's a lot of anger. There's so many emotions. And, you know, we have to talk to our children. So I guess the first question I have for the moms is, what are you talking to your children about? How are you talking to your children? And, and, and how is it going? Feel free to jump in, anyone. <laughs> Hi, I'll jump in. Um, I, I, we started this whole um, experience that we're all kind of having at the same time in my home with a um, family meeting. And we just asked them, right, what is it that you're hearing and what are you feeling about what you hear? Um, and then we just kind of opened the forum for them to actually just tell us what it is that they're experiencing. And then we took, you know, a, a page out of Dr. Abernathy's play, uh, playbook, right? So we literally just kind of mirrored a little bit back to them and allowed them to kind of just express um, and voice it. And then we tried to couch some of that with some of that historical information and why all of these things are going on and what is it that we're now gonna do um, given the, the, the space that we're in. Um, and we basically, as we often do, allowed our kids to lead us with imagination. And so if we ask them, like, what do you think we should do? How do you think we should act? Or we, we let them lead us and, and just using kind of imagination and then kind of reined it back in a little bit um, to kind of perform as parents, right? <laughs> but allowing them to to definitely um, set the stage and the tone for how we were gonna act in this situation because it was new to all of us. Great, great advice, thank you. And any other ladies wanna weigh in? Yeah, um, the <laughs> trauma and even the re-traumatization is real. Um, uh, when there were killings years ago and they continue to be killings, I stopped having um, my now nine-year-old be an earshot of the news. Um, and so I was aware now that we're in the midst of two pandemics, um, one which a very social child is having to be at, in, ho in the home and there all the time, um, not wanting him again to hear the news, but it, it, he heard, um, and it was interesting, the first thing he was concerned with was the pandemic. Um, how is how are all of these people protesting mommy when we need to be in in the house and we need to protect 
ourselves. Um, and so walking him through what it means to protest and how that has been some uh, a reaction that in this moment is actually having a an effect and that um, is a good thing. And yes, we want them to be safe and we hope that no one is transmitting the disease, but being able to um, hear his concerns um, and just what, what has been said already, just listening to um, his own anxiety around this moment in time that he is witnessing, even as I tried to shield him from it all. So yeah, really just listening and hearing the concerns that he has. Yeah. So if I can chime in, can you hear me okay? Um, one of my children, my 11-year-old daughter, was sitting me, with me as um, we watched the protests on Fayetteville Street. And my office is on Fayetteville Street, and we saw the vandalism and things that were going on. She asked, you know, why? And we answered her with great transparency, and we explained to her that George Floyd was killed. We um, modified the language. We didn't tell her specifics. Um, we did tell her that he was killed by a police officer. And we did tell her that it was uh, at, from the color of his skin. And we talked about racism. Um, as an, a child who has always been an old soul, it's always fascinating to talk about things like racism with her because it's just completely illogical. It's like it, she is so extreme in not understanding something that is so illogical that adults should be smarter and why don't they understand that that this shouldn't happen and it's just so fascinating um, to see the world through their eyes you know as Amanda had said earlier it's tremendous what you learn um, about from your kids so I, I, I think I continue to ask her questions um, and I'm sorry as, have her ask me questions and and listen to how she's feeling Thank you. That's great insight. Really good insight. Um, Absolutely. Um, uh, yeah. Um, so, you know, this is, um, I think this is a pretty uh, impactful question and it's certainly one that I'm curious about and I'm sure others are curious as well. Um, as a mother, um, what is it that you wish other mothers understood? Uh, other mothers who are of a different race, of a different socioeconomic background, uh, what is it that you wish they understood? Whether you're a black mother, a white mother, um, Hispanic mother, what is it that you wish other mothers could understand? I, um, I like to, to speak on that question. I, I have a 16-year-old son and an eight-year-old son, and um, and listening to Lauren speak um, when she was talking to her, her daughter about what happened and what was going on. I think the biggest difference is as a black mother, you don't have as much um, leeway or ability to, um, I won't say censor, but really form and explain what's going on. As, as a black parent and a, a parent of a black son, it's important to be brutally honest. Um, my son actually came to me. He saw the video before I did. And he said, Mom, did you see that video? Um, so the conversation that I have with him is one where I can tailor it to make him feel okay. And I think that's one of the key differences between Black moms and white moms and parents is that by virtue of being an African American, we don't have the luxury of, you know, kind of parse, mincing our words um, because it can make the difference in life or death. You know, they don't know how to respond to the police. And even if they do, um, you know, what, what happens? I used to tell my son, you know, if, you know, that talk is, you know, be polite and answer and, you know, say yes and no. And, you know, it's just all these things that you tell your, your children to do. And it sounds ridiculous. And, you know, the goal was always for them, to, you know, I'd say, we want you to, to get home alive, you know. But I would say, you know, if you ever were under a situation, God forbid that you were taken to the police station, you ask for your lawyer. Don't ask for your mother. I'm an attorney, but don't ask for your mother. Ask for your attorney. My instinct is always, how do I make sure that they're taken care of? And he has to, like, he's got to know grown up things and what can happen. And I think that is really. Um, what makes it 
all the more difficult because of, as black moms, we just don't have the luxury. It, we've just got to be honest. And white parents, because it's a different world, it, you're, you're not presenting the same things to your children. Interesting. Anyone else? I would like to chime in. I am currently leading our congregation through a Bible study on the book of Exodus. And it's so surreal how the book of Exodus uh, speaks to our current moment in time. And if you look there in chapter two, and I'm sure we all remember this story of Moses um, being put in a, a basket and his mother and his sister making sure that it um, was put in the Nile and, and went down the river. And who found it but Pharaoh's daughter. And so to just look at this sort of racial ethnic uh, makeup that um, his mother and his sister, Hebrews, um, put him in the Nile, which was the decree that uh, they should be put to death, all the Hebrew boys. And yet, um, who found him but Pharaoh's daughter? And Pharaoh's daughter looked upon him, it says, scripture says, with pity, and said, this is one of the Hebrew boys. What I would want my um, white sisters to, to feel and to know is that this is, we're all in this together. Um, you have to feel about my little boy um, the way I feel about my little boy and want his thriving and his flourishing in these United States if we're going to get through this together. Um, and we can look at the biblical narrative and see that even in Pharaoh's house, his own daughter looked with pity um, and took Moses in. And then we know Moses was raised as a prince of Egypt. And so I pray that um, we would all see this as an African uh, communal <laughs> moment in which we are taking care of the village together, but our children, right? We talk about Black Lives Matter, and yes, different conversations are happening, but um, when the white uh, mothers see our Black sons as if they were one of their own, I think that is going to change the mindset and get us to the place we need to be. These are just great answers, ladies, because um, I think that we're all learning from each other. Like I said, I learned from my kids. And one of the things that my daughters said to me, and they are um, very uh, much like your 11 year old daughter, Lauren, very like, we don't understand. We don't understand how racism is still an issue today. Um, and they taught me and they said these exact words. Mom, it's not enough not to be racist. You have to be anti-racist. You have to speak out. Um, and as a journalist, you know, that's something I'm not used to doing. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I think to your point, um, Crystal, every, they're all our children. Black, white, they're all our children. And as mothers, um, we have to look out for everyone's children. And that's what this time is about. Um, so I would like to just throw out to the panel, you know, what are your hopes and dreams for your children? What's, what's the world going to look like in five years, in 10 years? I mean, what, what do you think this moment, uh, the possibilities of this moment could take us to, to a, to a different place with real tangible change? Is that for any mom or just the mom panel? I want to let um, the senator speak. I deferred, I deferred to the senator because that's what um, my hope is. You know, um, I, what I hope for my kids is the same thing I hope for myself. And that is that I can um, check my own um, needs uh, and, and recognize how that impacts um, people who aren't as fortunate as I am. Um, I, that's what I've been struggling with is the fact that it's, um, I used to think that um, it could be a win-win, okay? And if I just concentrate on how we all do well together, that, that that would be good enough. And it's not good enough, okay? And um, I'm still kind of learning what that means. Um, and I think um, my, now my kids are in their late 30s. Okay, so um, we don't necessarily have these conversations, but um, I think they're way ahead of me in that, in that um, uh, they, uh, uh, 
they expect me to do better. Um, and they're kind of pulling me along. But, um, uh, you know, it's, I, I loved, I think it was Dr. Abernathy that said, you know, we have to do this together. And that gives me hope that I can be part of the solution. I do worry, um, not so much as mom, but because of where I work, um, I worry uh, about backlash. And I don't know quite how to protect the people I love, um, including my fellow senators from that backlash. Um, but I, um, I worry about that a lot. And, I worry about social media and polarization and um, all of these barriers. I wish I could get rid of Fox News and Facebook and um, all of those things that drive us to our corners so that we come, can um, uh, just, just kind of check our egos and, and bring some humility to the, to the discussion. Uh, like Senator Terry, I definitely, um, I'm, my hope is really aligned with what I hope for myself too. So I, I'm hoping the same thing for my kids and myself. And that is in the spaces that we inhabit, we really use like the moments that we have with the people that we're interacting with to just show up so that we can change a mindset. Um, it's a challenge that I have for myself. It's a challenge that I have for my kids because I really believe that you'd never know who you're um, interacting with. And things are changed. I always tell my kids things are changed at the dinner table and on the golf course. And if you can somehow show up in the lives of the people that you're interacting with, you can be the drop that ripples and changes things. Um, like I could be talking to somebody and I'm just telling them a story about my experience, but they end up going to dinner with their mom, who's Senator Terry. And then she turns around and experiences it in such a really impactful way that she wants to go and introduce a bill about it. Like it, to me, it literally registers like that. Like I, in the space that I inhabit, can make a change if I just show up and I'm authentic and I'm vulnerable and I and I give my kids the same charge. Great responses, ladies. Um, you know, I have a question uh, just springboarding off of Senator uh, Van Dyne, uh, who talked a little bit about you hinted at not hinted at, but you basically saying, you know, sometimes being an ally comes at with a price, right? And I'm wondering as women, as mothers, as part of this um, community together, how can we support one another? How can we support our allies, uh, you know, who may experience backlash? Uh, how can we support um, women, mothers who are in the marginalized communities? What can we do collectively to come together and support one another and fortify the mission? Because you know, tackling these issues, it's a mar marathon. That's, that's not a sprint. It's not, you know, a quick fix. It's not something that, uh, you know, easily gets uh, remedied, you know, right away. So how, how can we support one another? How can we be better sisters, I guess? Um, one of the things that I think is really important is that we listen. And as a politician, um, that's not always my first, um, go-to thing. Um, I think I want to take charge and fix things. And I think in, 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 in speaking as a person, um, speaking as a white person, I need to step back. Okay, so it's not just listen, but it's giving um, women of color um, a, a, a place to speak themselves um, and speak for themselves. Uh, and, um, and then it's my job uh, to, to back them up and to make sure that, they, that they're heard and they feel respected and they feel appreciated. And I think um, if we took more time to appreciate each other, 
and make each other feel appreciated. Um, I, I, it just feels to me that that's what I'm trying to do more of is step back and particularly give, I am very fortunate in that um, I serve with a number of African American senators and I'm, I'm trying um, uh, to, to support them to, to make their voices um, heard. I think one of the things, I, I definitely think listening is invaluable um, because whenever we create space for someone's voice, we help to validate who they are. And I think in this season, we cannot be afraid to say the wrong thing in a relational setting. Um, we need to take risks in some of our relationships. So I think that any type of uh, relationship is a system, but also systemically, when I find out, um, you know, when I speak with a local judge about a domestic violence case, you know, a client that I, that I see, I don't name them because I'm not representing them in that way. And they tell me as an excuse that the laws were created in the 1700s. I say, well, sir, uh, we need to do something about this. And so even our police officers, reform can only go as far as the legislation. So we need for people to listen, but we also need for people to speak up. Because if you're in a position of power and privilege, your voice goes so much further. I, and, and we do want to speak up, you speak for ourselves, but we know the power of the collective voice. And I think that the silence has been so long. And so even as a clinician, one of the things they train us to do when we think about diversity is if I have someone who is an indigenous person or a Latino and they come in, it's not their responsibility to teach me everything about their experience. I need to empathize with them on a human level and also listen and share and use the power that is inherently in the room to come alongside them, not to care for them or to uh, kind of pacify them. So the future I would want and the conversations that I would want would be relational here at this table and, you know, get together, have tea, coffee, but also uh, in the Senate. I really, really, really hope that the laws that were written in the 17 and 1800s, none of us would have rights, okay, <laughs> as women, that they would be reformed, I mean, rewritten, <laughs> pen to paper. That is, that is really what has to happen because laws govern uh, the atmosphere. And so what the sad part is, our kids are getting the messages and their friends, because some of my daughter's friends who are not African-American, they're hurting because it is not illegal to kill us. And until it's illegal, we're gonna have this conversation in this painful way but the conversation is so necessary and this is a beautiful uh, moment. And I know that so, it's, it's just gonna be exponential what's gonna come from this. So we honor the women who uh, were courageous enough to say yes to this night. Now, I would echo what um, Dr. Vanessa Abernathy said and the Senator as well. Um, it's so awesome that we have black mothers and white mothers coming together in this. I, I talk to my friends all the time about this. I tell my kids this, you know, you can't fight racism just as one group. Black people can't fight racism by themselves. We can't make changes by ourselves. We've got to have allies. And there's so many people, there's so many white people out there that want to help and want to do something. And I think, you know, that we need allies. Um, you know, if we know that we, like you all were saying, if we, we know we have allies, that's how you can be anti-racist. You know, you stand up and, you know, you, you support and you speak out. You know, it's one thing to listen, and I think listening is good, and discussions are good. But what I hope comes out of everything that's going on is in a few months that everybody has some discussions and then nothing happens. You know, a corporation puts out a statement and they say that we're going to talk about diversity and listen to our employees. That's great, but what we need is we need action. We need change makers, which is why this is so amazing, this panel, um, because it, it just really speaks to all of the women who really want to make a change. Um, so I think that also, I think that's also what will help you teach your children how to be anti-racist. If you can really stand up and say, 
this is wrong. And if you're with a group of friends and, you know, and they say something and you say, that's, that's not right. Um, your children will, will learn from that as well. So I think as moms, we have that power. We have the ability to show our children, you know, this is, this is what you can do. And this is the power that you have. And if you take it and you don't just, you know, hold it, but really try to do something with it, then you really can make a change and you can change the mentality, which, you know, goes to the police departments as well. You know, you, you know, you talk about training, we talk about laws, but, you know, ultimately we've got to make sure that the mentality changes of police officers that, you know, don't look at African-Americans the same way and don't value the lives the same way. So it's really important to really try to figure out how can we change the mentality of a person. Once you can start to change your mentality, then too with that with that very um, that the conversation and the, the the discussion that Dr. Vanessa Abernathy was speaking of, you really can start to do some things um, collectively. And I, and I think. Oh, I'm sorry. I would just like to get on my soapbox for a minute because I think um, obviously policing is 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 very important. Um, we need to address that, but it's not just policing. Um, education inequities, healthcare inequities, um, uh, housing inequities. Um, these are persistent, and they've been persistent for decades, if not centuries. And to fix that, um, we need to be willing to make investments that are going to cost money. And, um, and we need to support elected officials that are willing to do that. And um, it's almost, we've almost ceded that ground that um, we should be able to do all these things and not spend money. And, um, and that's just wrong. Uh, North Carolina, we need, uh, North Carolina is like 39th in per pupil spending. Um, we need to do a better job of that so that all our children get a good education. Um, we need to expand Medicaid. Um, and, and, and make those investments so that children have access to mental health in schools, as well as a, a well-qualified teacher. So I just, um, I, I just think it's important that we remember that racism is systemic and it's not just in policing, it's in every aspect of our life. And we have to address all of them together at once if we're going to be successful. That, that's a great point. Um, I, I also think for those of us who have some older children, teenager, maybe college students, we have to allow them uh, to speak their mind. And um, I'm interested in Lauren and Lottie. Uh, my 17-year-old and my 20-year-old feel very strongly. They wear Black Lives Matter bracelets. And when we go into a situation, they want to talk to adults, they want to talk to white adults and share their strong opinions. And I said, as long as you're polite and civil, you know, go for it. And um, sometimes these are family friends and sometimes they don't always appreciate what my kids have to say. But I feel like the need to allow them to express that. W what do you guys think? What do you think, Lottie? I know you have a 16 year old boy. I do, I have a 16 year old son. And I think that as we navigate this time and space, finding a way to support him developing his voice because as a white mother, sadly, it is somewhat a matter of choice how much we engage. And it's a time where we have to engage and we have to teach our kids how to engage. And we have to listen, but we also have to start speaking because we've been quiet as a group for too long. And we need to teach our children and their friends and all young people to get to the polls and to vote because to dismantle systemic racism is gonna cost money. And to get that investment, it's gotta translate by the will of the people. So we need to train our children how to be social activists and how to do it. And being on this panel has been humbling and terrifying because 
I'm learning what that looks and sounds like for myself. And how, how do I engage in those conversations? My own home, with my own children, yeah, yeah, with my circles of predominantly white friends and colleagues. And how can I, how can I be a change maker? So um, those are my thoughts. <laughs> Laura, yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah, so my two oldest sons are, are stepsons that are 18 and 21. Um, I've been with their dad since they were one and three. So they're, so they're mine for all practical purposes. Um, I had a really interesting conversation with my, my 21 year old son that I, that I didn't necessarily um, expect. Um, you know, they live in two households and you, you assume that your kids take on your values. And one thing that I didn't realize while um, in right now is that um, the other family that they go back and forth of that maybe has a little bit narrower views of what we have in our household. And so um, some of the things he was saying to me were very, um, maybe things that were said in that household that and he was expressing a lot of confusion. Um, he expressed to me that um, well, first of all, you know, racism is a is a bipartisan problem. But however, my 20 year old son is is talking about um, how confused he is by the media. Um, he's he's talking about that he doesn't he's watching multiple channels and he doesn't know what to believe. And then his grandparents are telling him one thing that all lives matter. And then our household is telling him that black lives matter. And he's very confused and he's, um, it's very stressful for him. And um, he even said that, that some days he'd like to go live in the middle of nowhere <laughs> because it was, really, um, it was really something that he didn't know how to get his head around. Um, I'll tell you that in the conversation, I started to get a little bit emotional because I have such extreme views um, about, um, about all children being my children. Um, you know, being someone that's Jewish, that's also Hispanic, I have a really interesting perspective on the world because I've dealt with swastikas on my temple and I've dealt with my father, you know, being treated like garbage because they couldn't understand his accent. So um, even though I have a white face, um, I, I'm really um, very, very passionate. When I was trying to talk to him and listen to him very calmly, my husband at one point kind of said, back off. And um, but what was very interesting about the perspective of the conversation is I realized that we need to listen. We really need to listen and understand the other side. And it's really easy to say, oh, you're not going to be my friend anymore. But when it's your son, it's like you're not going to disown your son. <laughs> you know, so it really put me in the weirdest position as a mom. And, um, and, and again, in my brain, um, I just, I, I didn't know quite how to handle it. I will say since then, I've talked to some friends that have opposing views because I realized the only way we're gonna really change things is we can't just talk to the people who believe the same things we believe. We need to have an understanding of why they believed it. If they grew, if they're white and they grew up in a trailer park, and, and all the black people they knew were people who got in trouble. How can we expect these people to think any different and uh, differently? So what I'm seeking to do as a change maker is try to understand how can I make this not a political um, issue, but, but one that racism is, is something that is really teaching someone about humanity and bringing people back to the humanity. Um, so, so to me, I think that this dialogue's really changed me and, and quite a bit, and that's because of my children. Thank you, Thank you so much. I, I can appreciate that. And um, uh, Lottie, you just messaged that, you know, the personal narrative is, is important. And I think that's true. I mean, we're, as mothers, uh, we're all storytellers, uh, weaving this story for our children, teaching them about history as well as the present. And then we also have hopes for the future. And, uh, and I agree with Lauren, you know, 
we should stretch and grow and try to uh, include in our conversation in this discourse people who disagree with us. Not so that we can be changed in our position because that's an individual choice, but so that you can in the very least expand your understanding and knowledge of the community that you exist in. Uh, and as we've all said tonight, we're all in it together. We're on this big rock floating in the universe and none of us can jump off. We've kind of got to stay on board. Uh, but it's not an easy road, but I am so grateful to know such amazing women that have come out tonight, those that joined us this evening, willing to take on this tough topic uh, and willing to push this rock uphill because again, it's a marathon, it's not a sprint, and it's going to take individual work as well as collective work in our community. So I applaud each and every one of you. Thank you to our panelists for lending us their expertise. Thank you to Amanda Lamb, an amazing uh, award winner journalist who has been a truth teller for decades and thank you to the UN Women NC chapter for coming up with this concept and this idea and I'm very excited to see uh, where we go next. Uh, Sega, I think I want to toss it over to you. I think you're going to, to wrap us up and, and close us out. Ooh. Can I just say one thing before we go? Um, yes. I just want to say again what echo what you said. I mean this is this is what it's all about right now this moment in history is about conversation um i wrote a blog on monday called in conversation um, we are in conversation with each other we are in conversation with our families we're in conversation with our children our spouses our partners um our co-workers never before in history have we all been in conversation it's never happened um it really hasn't and so i think as women, um, as mothers, as leaders in our community, uh, we got to run with it. I mean, we need to make sure that I think somebody said, let's not go in, five, in, in a couple months and have these companies say, we're going to do this, and then they don't do it. Or, um, you know, people in our circles say, I'm going to behave this way, and then they don't behave that way. Let's hold people accountable. Let's hold people accountable. It's time. Um, that everybody be part of this conversation um, to be on the right side of history. And I honestly have so much hope. Um, a real quick anecdote. Last week, I had uh, 42 members of my graduating high school class. 37 years ago, I'm dating myself. They all wanted to get on a Zoom and talk about this. And what can we do? What can we do? I mean, I haven't seen these people, many of them in 37 years. And they all wrote and said, let's get together. Let's talk. Um, and we did. And, um, you know, it's just, I'm just, I'm very humbled to be part of this conversation. And I really appreciate all of you ladies being here tonight. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, Dr. Abernathy just chatted uh, that this is a global conversation for a global community. And, um, you know, we love the conversation and we also are ready for action. So uh, on that note, we have a lot of work to do, but I, I feel like I'm in good company. Women that are ready to roll up their sleeves and uh, tell the story that their children, grandchildren and great grandchildren will be proud of. So uh, Sega, I think you're gonna close this out. Well, wow. I don't know what to say, but uh, to definitely congratulate on this moment and on this age of change uh, for the, all the change makers that are on this uh, um, and this evening. Uh, I know that life is a choice architecture. So we do need, um, I'm glad that we were able to talk about the intellectual humility that everybody said there are things that we need to fix. I think that's an important component. So I believe that there is also an intentional leadership and also an institutional courage that's going to take us past the present pain forward to a better living for all of us. So this conversation is about r, &R resilience and renewal. And I'm looking forward to more of these where we will just uh, bring about other components or other members of our society, especially our young people. Those are the future. That's the generation that we'll be talking about and continuously look into uh, ways for us to connect back and bring back, bring about the change. Um, my, our, obviously, this was just the beginning of something better. I do know that uh, there's a book that says, big doors swing on small hinges. 
in the same way that a big door swings on a much smaller hinge. So we are the hinge and I know we have a choice and I know uh, it's all about the decisions of those hinges that are gonna keep on collecting us, connecting us and continue on having this conversation again. So I thank you very much for your time. I thank you very much for your candor. I thank you very much for your intentional leadership. And I also thank you for being um, open into this safe space and to all our uh, participants that have joined us from various parts of uh, the world. We have some people from England, we have some people from uh, Sweden, and I know they stayed up late, so I appreciate that. Um, and we all have a currency, currency of time, and spending our time in this manner is obviously one of the best things that we could do, a gift to ourselves and a gift to our children. So I would like to close with the fact that uh, we want to connect back through our Q&A. Um, before you leave, you will be asked to respond to, um, I think the system will ask you to respond to a couple of questions that we have in there. It's a poll, but we also would like to connect back with you. And if you wish to do so, please let us know. We are here, we need your voice in many ways, in many ways. And I thank you for the amazing journalists, I've got new friends, I've got new sisters, I've got a new family. God bless you all. May the beautiful surprises today and every day. Thank you. Bye everyone. Good night. Thank you ladies.